Here's a secret. 90% of watercolor painting is the two techniques I've been showing you today. Wet on wet and then wet on dry. It's really just as simple as that. The trick is in when to use them, what quantities to use them in, how much water to use, which is really the best way to learn that is just by painting a lot. But uh, at this stage, we're going to actually move to adding some detail wet on dry to our rows. And we're going to talk a little bit about how much water to use while we're, while we're doing that. Mark Taro Holmes has described painting uh, as having paint, how much water to use as three different stages. He calls them tea, milk, and honey. And I think he actually learned that from another artist. Um, it's, a, it's, a t it's a great way to describe how much water you should be using. When we were painting our wet and wet layer, we were working with tea. Uh, really juicy pigment, lots of fluidity, and uh, very little pigment, or very little pigment, mostly very juicy, juicy uh, washes and quantities of it. As you start to refine detail, then you start to work with uh, milk, and I like to call it an inky consistency, kind of the same, same concept. And that inky consistency, which is what I'm working with now, slightly higher proportion of paint and a little less water. And that gives you a little more control. And right now I'm just defining, creating some shadows actually. I'm using ultramarine blue. And the transparency of the ultramarine blue over the pink will give us just a little feeling of shadow on our painting that's going to help define our flower. And because my pencil lines were quite dark, I'm probably not going to, I don't want to go as dark as I should to cover them up. So they're going to show through and I wouldn't plan for that if this were a uh, painting I was planning to exhibit or sell. I would have definitely a little more control over how dark my pencil lines are going to be. Sure makes it easier for you to see what I'm doing. Um, so I'm using just right now a little bit of quinacridone magenta and a little bit of the ultramarine blue to fill in this little curve of the petal here and that's going to give me a feeling of um, this little fold in our petal and it's also that milky consistency, that inky consistency that I like that gives me a little more control, it's not going to flow all over the place, it's just going to kind of stay right where I place it. And we want to cover up some of that green that flowed in here. So then we'd go back to maybe kind of our, our tea layer again. And again, because it's a tea layer, it's quite transparent. So some of that color still shows through. I can mix a slightly richer consistency of, violet, of the magenta. And it's a little bit dark because the green behind it will, will show through a bit. But I have a little bit more coverage by increasing the amount of pigment on my in my mixture. And so that's more of that milk idea. Just like milk is milky, milky water is not very transparent, so a milky consistency of paint has just got a higher saturation of paint, so less of the background is going to show through than if you were using that tea consistency. So the idea of tea, milk, and honey doesn't just apply to how much water to use, but it applies to how uh, transparent your color is going to appear as well. Um, now I've got a little, more, a little more color added. You can see as well that makes my flower darker. And so remember that whenever you add paint to your painting, you are taking away from the white of the, pa the paper you're covering up white or light in your painting. And so really some of the most beautiful paintings show an incredible amount of restraint. And it takes skill to not just slap your, paint, your painting full of color uh, and to know when to hold back. And sometimes that's what indicates mastery is that ability to, to not overdo it. And I think it's often that way in watercolor. So when in doubt, slow down, step back, evaluate, instead of just continuing to paint on without really knowing what your painting needs. So on this side, I've just kind of added a little bit more rich magenta and then blended it out 
I'm going to add a little bit of blue for shadow right in here where those two petals kind of meet. But I'm going to keep it fairly simple. I don't want to overdo it. And in fact, I'm not loving the areas where I place the blue there. Not everything works all the time. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to leave it. Okay, we want to add some detail to our leaves. And that's where we talk about doing kind of a honey layer. And uh, the very final details, the very smallest amount of painting should happen in those final layers. So just like if you were making a cup of tea and adding milk and honey to it, uh, you add lots of tea, a whole cupful, a little, you know, maybe a spoonful of milk, and then just a dab of honey. So it's the same way with painting. When you get to that honey stage, it's really a, it's a, it's a short-lived stage. You don't do a lot with it. So maybe I want to paint some veins. And I'm using, again, the honey layer, which is a nice, rich saturation of pigment. So lots of pigment and very little water, just enough water to keep the color moving so that it does my brush doesn't just stick to the paper. And uh, that means less of the painting shows through where I've painted those little honey honey lines. And this is where we get to refine and add detail. The line is emphasis. It's like exclamation points. We don't use 400 of them <laughs> when we're writing, unless we want to sound like teenagers. And so just the way we use restraint with exclamation points, we use restraint with how much detail we add. We don't have to paint every detail that we see. I'm painting enough veins, so I want some rhythm, so I, I don't want to leave any out. But I also don't feel like I need to outline my shapes. And that bled a little bit. I don't think it's going to, I think I'm going to let it bleed. So just a few lines to make things interesting. I feel like I'll add a little thing there. And we're going to do a little bit of honey detail in the center of our rose as well. And I think that's going to really cap it off. Uh, this time using quinacridone gold, it's a little bit warmer and richer than the lemon yellow we were using. And instead of painting, there's a little knob in the center of the, of the rose, but I'm not going to paint a circle, a ring around it. I'm just going to paint a half a circle or a C shape. I find incomplete shapes to be more pleasing to look at most of the time than complete shapes. And when I'm painting these little stamens that come out from the center, I move out from the center. I pull out and up. And I'm actually going to turn my board so I can pull in that direction rather than push. And the reason we do that is generally when we put our brush on the first time, we press a little harder than we need to. So as we pull away, we lift up and our line gets narrower. And I'm going to sprinkle in a few little polleny bits. That's the technical scientific term, I'm sure. And here where my petal was a little bit wet, I was kind of rushing things instead of waiting for it to dry. The color bleeds a little, but I kind of like that look, so I'm going to leave it. It adds to that watercolor feel, the fluid, flu, flowing fluidity. And I think that's really pretty. A little hint of the green gold in the center will, I think, make a connection between the leaves and the flower. And so I'm just going to touch a little green gold into that quinacridone. Um, circle that I painted. And I'm f feeling like I'm going to call that done. <laughs> Ordinarily, I'm laughing because these pencil lines really bother me. Uh, and I will show you a version that doesn't have the pencil lines just to make myself feel better. Um, this is another version of the same tutorial, and the pencil lines are not as dominant here. And so it just has a little bit more of a finished look, even though in this one, 
the only details that I added, my honey layer, were right in the center here. So uh, I still actually should go back and finish the uh, leaves of, of this one. And because my pencil lines were fainter, it just has a more finished effect. If you're painting something like this, something like this, and you're, you have those pencil lines, and you don't want to make your flower darker to cover them, one way to cover them is to make your background darker. Uh, so you could decide that you want to, uh, let me choose a color here. You could decide that you want to cover those pencil lines by creating a dark background. And a dark background can really make your light colored flower glow. I'm going to paint around the stem that is kind of invisible there. And it's a really good way painting that dark background. And that's just a sap green mixed with a Payne's gray. Is a painting a dark background can really make a light area glow. And it's the same technique we've been using all along. It's that dry, wet on dry, flowing color out, softening edges, add a little variety by maybe mixing in some straight Payne's gray, some pure sap green, and then continuing to move just around the painting. And you can see how that pencil line has completely vanished now as I painted around it and added that rich dark background. Be careful if you start to outline like this, as you don't walk away from it. Uh, go in right away before that line has a chance to dry so that you don't get any marks that look like an outline. If that had dried, then that line would show even after I painted over it with my background color. Hard lines show through. Uh, layers of additional washes. And if you want to really add some unity, you can add a little bit of the same pink in the background. And uh, that can create a really pretty effect as well. It doesn't have to be a solid green. You can dot in hints of other colors. Pulling with my brush as I paint along the petal gives me a nice smooth line. I don't lift my brush until I've completed the stroke, completed the shape. And that background, you can see how it's changing my flower. And I can just continue around using the same basically three colors. I'm using Payne's Gray, Sap Green, I think that's actually Deep Sap Green, and a little bit of the magenta here and there. And I wouldn't feel too bothered as if as you're learning to paint, you find that you're putting dark backgrounds in all your paintings because it's such a good way of tidying up uh, when you have kind of awkward lines or you have a tendency to create uh, a fuzzy edge when you're painting a shape. Um, going around it with a dark color, you know, that long, smooth stroke I'm doing, that can really give you a tidier, tidier line, a cleaner appearance to your painting. And uh, until you have a little better brush control, f you know, feel free to make that your signature thing for a while. It, it's uh, totally allowed. And as you get more comfortable wielding your brush and creating those shapes that you want the first time, you'll feel less need to do this kind of camouflaging dark backgrounds to hide your, 
your uh, any awkwardness that you've created. And I think it will be fun to put these side by side, the first one and the second one, and see what what we prefer. Often when I'm doing tutorials to show you in my online classes, I'm sharing things that I've taught in my in-person classes. I'm sharing things that I've painted many times because the more I paint something, the more confident I am in interpreting it, uh, the more I get to know it and understand how, um, how it helps us learn, actually. So I can say, okay, that wild rose I've painted hundreds of times is a great tutorial for learning how to paint uh, small areas with the wet and wet technique and learning brush control um, and learning how to create hard and soft edges, which is what we're learning here. And now we're learning how to create a background. Pulling the brush, I don't push when I'm handling my brush. This is a really finicky little line, so I have to be really careful in how I handle it. The other thing to remember is once you start to add that background, you need to make sure your painting is completely dry because any little area that's a little bit damp, you're going to get some bleeding happening. And that's going to uh, eliminate our opportunity to have those clean lines that we're talking about creating. You can't get a clean line on a damp piece of paper. So I create that quick outline and then I fill it in before it dries. Keeping my hand nice and low on the brush so I have good brush control. Right here I have a dry line so you're going to see now how it shows through as I add this as I connect these areas. What I should have done was faded that color away with the damp brush and I just <laughs> somehow overlooked it. So that's okay, my mistake will help us to understand a concept. So you can see, I think, you can see that line there, it's really quite dominant. Crisp lines just are very visible and uh, that's the transparency of watercolor for you. So there's a couple things we can do and I'll show them to you. Over here if I don't hustle I'm going to get a crisp line too. Okay, so when you have a crisp line and it's not, and it's showing through, one thing we want to do is just use your brush to try to scrub that line uh, away. And just by going back and forth a little with your brush, you can usually soften that hard edge. And then you just kind of want to go darker over it. That's the main, main way of solving that is just to cover it up. And then I'm going to bleed this color this way to blend it with this layer. And when you soften an edge like that, go take your water further than you think you need to. It's always better to give the paint more room to move than you think you're going to need. Because anywhere it, if that color, if that pigment's still moving where it hits the dry spot where you stopped adding water, it's going to create a line again. So yeah, keep pulling that color across the paper. So there we have a rose with a dark background. And here we have a rose with a light background. 
So which one do you think is better? They both have their own merits. This one I almost feel like now I would need to add maybe a little bit more shadow to separate the petals just to give it a little more depth in the painting. But I do love that rich dark contrast. It's very dramatic. It has uh, just a different feel. So we can change our mood just by changing our background.